before I start, actually one of the best stories I could tell about our um, long, and we always like to bring it up because it, it burnishes your reputation a little bit, with, with Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, is that in 1970, when I got married, my father gave me shares in Berkshire Hathaway as a wedding present. And I immediately sold the shares to pay for my honeymoon. And uh, I sometimes, people sometimes ask me, have you ever gone back and calculated what it's worth? And I said, no, but I'm still married to the same woman, so it's been a good investment. Um, but, uh, that's just one anecdote about the Buffett Association. I don't have any, any canned speech for you. I'm sure you're all probably too knowledgeable that I don't want to end up spending a lot of time boring you because it, it'll probably be an awkward place for you to sneak out of and not be noticed. So I think I'll leave a lot of time for questions that you may have. Um, but I would at the outset make a few remarks um, really on what we do, the concept, if you will, the framework, how we go about it, uh, to why, why we do it the way we do do it. And I'll speak more, if you will, generally or generically about the whole idea of having a process and how important we think it is. And then briefly just comment on some of the myths about value investing, because I still think there are, there are some of those out there um, that exist, and I'm not sure that they're really entirely accurate as to what people in our business do, even though it is a very big umbrella in which a lot of people crawl under to say they're value investors. I think in reality, I don't think anybody would tell you that they're not buying value when they invest in some financial instrument. Um, you know, there's been volumes written about this. You've probably read a lot of it. Why it works, who does it, why do they do it? Um, I even recently saw something where they talked about they said that maybe there's something about the genetic makeup of the people that do it that enables them to do this or explains why they do do it. Now, I think that's kind of pushing the dime a bit too far. I don't think genetically I'm very much different from anybody else in the world. Nothing that seems to distinguish me from, from anyone else who's in this business. But first, the, what I think are the misperceptions. And some of it goes back to a phrase I think Warren Buffett coined. And one of them is that the value investors are the guys that um, buy the cigar butts. I refer to it as sort of the corporate hospice patients of the world. They go in and they buy the things that the, the rag pickers are going through to find a, find a dime or a, a dollar on the ground, and, and they can go out and sell it somewhere else for $2. And I think that originally emanated from the, from the fact that Graham had been a really very statistically oriented in the way he invested, but... If you spoke to most people who invest under this moniker, they'd tell you they much prefer, when available, to buy a good business at a discount. And it's all about buying these things at a spread, at a discount, because what you get when you buy a good business, of course, is you not only get the spread, and hopefully the spread will close at some point in time in a marketplace, but then you get the, you get the compounding from a good business. So you get you really end up getting a double dip. That's much better than, than buying a business that you know is just a, a lump of lead and lead has a market price and you get rid of it and it's not going anywhere. Because, and when you do that, of course, you have your silent partner if you're a taxpayer, and most of us are taxpayers, and he ends up, depending upon where you live, if you're fortunate enough to live in the state of New York and you sell it within 12 months, the government's going to take over 50% of what you've earned. And that makes for some very ugly makeup arithmetic. When you start all over, you have less than 50 cents on the dollar that you thought you had to go back and reinvest. And I think one of the other things that people sometimes think about value investors is that they, they somehow operate in a vacuum. Um, I've sometimes, just to be amusing, described it as this person walks into the office in some sort of blessed, yoga-induced state of mind and goes into his office and closes the door and comes out two weeks later and says, I've got one. Completely indifferent to the world at large, gets his idea, comes out, puts his money in it, and walks off and makes lots of money and then goes through the process again. I don't think that's absolutely accurate either. Um, sometimes people talk about you don't pay attention to market fluctuations, but 
when you do invest, you have to pay attention to what, what is going on, perhaps less so about the world around you than about the dynamics in the industry you might be investing in. What is going on in that industry? If you, if you worked in a vacuum and were largely quantitative, you might well have two years ago bought all the Italian banks. Now, if you'd done that, you've actually probably done all right. But at that point in time, there were a lot of unanswerables if you did do that, depending upon how things might break in that part of the world. And there are those considerations when you, when you look at something. So value investors, one, they're not rag pickers, and two, they're not operating in a vacuum. And the third one that always is cyclical when comes up is that, uh, well, value investing is finished because everyone does it. And then on the other hand, people would say at a point in time it does well. Why isn't everybody doing it? And this kind of argument comes and goes and ebbs and flows. And I think that will continue to be the case at least as long as I'm in the business and I have less, if you will, tread on my tires than you folks, but I'm going to be around a bit longer. Uh, and so much of that really comes from the simple fact of the way people approach markets. And uh, the fundamental flaw that people have, and I'll talk about that, is, is one that enables people with a process, and uh, if they have a process which is somewhat akin to the way we do it, you're able really to capitalize on the, the mistakes that uh, the average investor continually makes. And those are, are the misperceptions. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the framework. Framework, I mean process. And if you walk out of these courses and decide you're going to be an investor, whether you, if you will, adopt this approach or not, I would say if you don't have a process, you're probably doomed in this business because what you have is all of the outside pressures which just grind away and eat away at any chance that you have for logical decision making. And you see words, I jotted down a few here that were uh, in the newspaper not too long ago. They were, they're words such as um, abyss, implosion of the euro, um, sharp sell-off, market collapsing. All these things just eat away at people's emotions all the time. Everything seems to be driving people to make decisions based upon rather short time frames and based upon variables which may not have an awful lot to do with the business in which they're making an investment. Um, even some of it comes down to to framing, you look at the you look at the newspaper, and someone will you'll read the newspaper, and you'll listen to it if you do it. And I'd suggest you not do it. Actually, um, they'll say market sells off 160 points, and oh God Almighty, 160 point collapse. Well, that's framing. And if someone said to you, "I owned a twenty dollar stock and it sold off twenty cents," you'd probably say, "Ah, well that doesn't make any difference." Well, that's what it is. That's what. That's what a 160-point drop in the stock market is, a $20 stock dropping 20 cents. So if you frame it differently, you think about, well, I don't need to get myself quite so excited about this. So in some respects, if you have a process, someone coined a phrase, and I think it's a good phrase. He called it emotion mitigation. You're trying to find some way to mitigate the emotional dimension, which is constantly driving people to make incorrect decisions. Um, it's clear, and there's a, you know, the, the data that's accumulating from behavioral finance really does, I think, substantiate the fact that we are, by and large, horribly wired to be objective. Um, now, I'm in the business where we're considered to be the most numerate, one of the more numerate of the industries in which you can go into. And all you have to do is look at the stock market on a daily basis to realize that, well, there's something going on besides just looking at numbers because it, business and things couldn't change that dramatically on a day-to-day -day basis. But, in fact, they are. They're going up and down. And this sort of gets in the way of people making decisions. There's a number of, of they've, they've researched this and looked at it, factors, all sorts of mistakes that people make. And a couple of them I just mentioned. One is... Um, confirmation bias, they've studied this, and people will, if they like a particular security, they'll, 
They'll really just read the reports which confirm their bias. They won't go out and seek the contrary point of view. They, they're looking for things which reaffirm the idea that they have. Um, another one is extrapolation. People will lock on to the most recent piece of news and they'll have a tendency to just take that and extrapolate it out ad nauseum. There was a very actually amusing article a couple of years ago in The Economist magazine about this, and this is just simply to dramatize in an amusing way the point. And um, the article was about the then daily murder rate in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles can have some very ugly days. And they took the murder rate that day and they extrapolated it out. And long about the year 2020, the last two people in Los Angeles shoot it out, and then there's nobody left in Los Angeles. So there is this tendency of extrapolation, overconfidence. The extrapolation is the anchoring on the most recent news. And then there's the other part, which is the institutional imperative. You know, don't just sit there, do something. And there's always this pressure to be doing something. Now, in our business, of course, we control it. But people are in the business of trading. If they're not trading, they're not doing something, they're not earning their pay, and nothing's happened. They haven't done their work. And there's always this pressure to be doing something. When, in fact, the best thing you can do, and we often say in our business, is sometimes doing nothing is a very proactive decision. Sometimes there's long periods of time where there just simply isn't a lot to do. My partner, John Spears, often refers to it. He says, let the stocks do the work. Let the business do the work. You don't have to do anything. Now, you keep looking for new and better or competitive ideas that might be more attractive than the one you have, but you don't necessarily have to do anything. So my point is there's all sorts of pressures which eat away at people's ability to be logical in this business. And it's this inability to be logical and to stand back and think through why you're investing and what you're investing for, which gets in the way so often of success in the business. I think it was a, it's actually a Canadian firm called Dalbar, does research on, on market returns. And I thought it was very fascinating. Dalbar did a 20 year study on mutual fund returns in the United States through year ending either 2008 or 2009. <clears throat> and I think during that period of time, the markets compounded at something on the order of 9 or 10 percent. And mutual funds compounded at 8%. You can't, everybody can't beat the market and you subtract the fees and that's all very logical, it makes sense. But the, what they were able to do because the data is published and available is they teased out, they claim to a very accurate degree, what the average investor in mutual funds did during that period of time. And um, you can look at share redemptions, share purchases, and get a sense of, of how people did. And the average investor over that almost 20-year period had a return of about 3%. And I think that just simply speaks to the fact that all of these pressures eat away at people because they don't have a framework to think about this whole process and anchor something that's, if you will, more objective and more logical. And it's never going to be completely logical because I, I happen to believe that investing is a social science. It's not, a, it's not a, uh, an empirical process. It's not a natural science. There's, there's no Newton's apple in this business. It's all about aligning as many probabilities as you can on your side, having, if you will, a number of bets on things that you think you have a reasonable chance of understanding that you believe are sustainable kinds of businesses, and then your outcomes will on average be favorable. Um, so it's important to have a focus and have an objective anchor. We sort of describe it as being in the business of trying to know something that's reasonably knowable, and, and I'll refer to what we think that is in a moment. Um, it ought to be just, if you will, cliches. It should not be intuitive. It should be reasoned. And it ought to be, to a very meaningful degree, timeless. And by that I mean you can apply it day in and day out 
in markets and it will lead you to make decisions about the things you own relative to where they are based upon your metrics for valuation and it ought to be universal meaning you can apply it across markets and in fact it if it's good it can be applied across markets because i think ultimately at the end of the day the facts the the forces that drive markets are very much the same they're not terribly different uh from market to market as you go around the world um we sometimes use the the phrase it ought to be reflective rather than reflexive and if it's reflective what it's going to do is it's going to extend your time horizon and the longer you can extend your time horizon the less competitive the game becomes because most of the world is engaged over a very short time horizon lots of competition lots of hollering lots of deciding what they're going to do about a security now what the outlook is for 6 months we often we often see it and i find it kind of amusing and i think it's partially a function it's not to criticize them because some of the analysts on on wall street are I mean they're very smart people they know their industries cold and um we do talk with them for background information we don't use them for securities valuation at all but if you're going to start looking at the jet engine business and want to get yourself up to speed rather than trying to recreate the wheel you can talk to someone who spends his whole life studying jet engines and and accomplish in 3 hours what might take you 3 weeks um so what that will do is enable you to look at things and ask yourself where are you going to be in 3 or 4 or 5 years because these poor people what they're looking at is they'll study the market and they'll say to themselves um and this is a term which always baffles me an expression uh I like it long term but I don't like it short term which I mean I know what they're trying to say their boss has told them unless something's going to happen in the next 6 months don't bother to write it up because most people want action what's implicit in that though is that they're going to be able to tell you that point in time where all of a sudden boom the switch is thrown now's the time to get in and the stock's going to go up my view is lots of luck moreover you may need many months to get the stock you want to own so start now and if your time horizon is longer uh you'll be in much better much better shape so it's it's important to have this process this framework now obviously we happen to think the framework that graham came up with is perhaps the best one and the logic we think is very compelling we um one of my former partners is since uh, since died an older gentleman was a man named Ed Anderson <clears throat> and I always wondered why Ed came into the business with us and Ed had been a physicist with the nuclear uh atomic energy agency in the United States and he was instrumental in the whether you like it or not the development of the hydrogen bomb and and Ed started reading books on value investing he read Graham's books and he said I don't want to make hydrogen bombs anymore I want to invest and we thought well you know what what is that all about and he said well it's the logic logic very compelling I'm a physicist I like the logic it makes sense I can I can work with this I see it and the logic is really based upon you know perhaps now telling you something that if you've read the books you know what it is and we refer to it as as Graham's big idea and that was that a share of stock is nothing more and nothing less than a fractional interest in a business. You know, Peter Peter Lynch paraphrased that by saying behind every stock is a business. And if you accept that that a, a share of stocks a fractional interest in a business, and a lot of people just simply don't because they see the market as something else, some other mechanism for for activity. Um if you accept that, then everything else really flows very logically from that. what you ought to be doing and spending your time doing is trying to figure out what a business is worth and businesses like your house or or an automobile whatever it is have a value and there's a long history of business values and you can spend time figuring out to within a fairly narrow range what a business is worth certain kinds of businesses are worth more than other kinds but if you simply put on a piece of paper a chart for business valuations they tend to move in rather narrow ranges over time now they may tick up because uh interest rates are a bit lower 
or they may tick down because of interest rates, but the range is rather narrow, and markets do this. Markets are all over the place. Um, they're driven by, by more emotional, if you will, uh, participants than the informed arm's length buyer of a business, and perhaps that explains why the business values may, may end up fluctuating. Uh, uh, the markets may fluctuate more and businesses fluctuate less. Now, Graham, when he, when he started, was, was originally a statistician. And his idea, he had been a credit analyst, was you buy a bond. Well, if you've got to buy a bond, you've got to have a lot of collateral backing it up, right? Um, because at the end of the day, you're going to get your principal back. You've got to make sure there's collateral so they can pay you off. Otherwise, you just, have the, you just have the coupon. And when he looked at equities, he said, well, I've got to have some collateral. So the collateral was figure out what the assets were worth or figure out what the businesses are worth. And buy it at a discount, get a spread, and that's your collateral, and make your investment and do it on a diversified basis, and it ought to work. And that's what he did. And when he originally started in the business, he was largely very statistical in his approach. And the old, you've heard it talked about, the net nets, the rest of those kinds of businesses. There's not many around now. Computers largely just sweep them up, unless people have believe that the world is pending collapse. Um, but we, we refer to that as it's sort of an underwriting aspect to investing. There's two broad components to doing. There's the underwriting part of it, and that's, you know, if we were all in the same family and we're going to put up some capital to start an automobile insurance business, we could probably very quickly come up with the, um, if you will, characteristics of the average driver we wanted to underwrite, and it would probably be, well, one, no, no teenagers, nobody with a motorcycle. Uh, let's just marry, let's just underwrite married couples between 35 and 55. They should have two children and drive a Volvo. And if they all did that and you underwrote them all religiously, you're going to make money because only one or two of them will get drunk on New Year's even hit a tree, hit a tree. The rest won't hit trees. You'll collect your, your, your premiums. And it was the same thing with this statistical approach. They're, they're quite simple. If you just religiously did it yourself and went off and had some capital and just spent your time doing it day in, day out, and you bought securities at large discounts to book value, low debt to equity, insiders purchasing stock, forget they've got to be purchases, and then you've got to examine whether they're purchasing it with their own money or whether it's just options exercises. But spending their own money. Stock has probably recently undergone a very substantial decline in value, and as I said, no debt. And if you align all of these factors, if you will, it enhances the probabilities, and on average, those securities do very well. And that's the underwriting side of it. The other side of it is, is the appraisal business, and that's really something that, that evolved out of Graham, but is very much anchored in the, in the same idea of buying a fractional interest in a business. You've got to, first of all, it's, we think of it as a two-step process in figuring out the value of a business. One, you have to look at the business and try and get a sense that you reasonably understand it. Is it, is it a, appear to be a sustainable business over time? All, we're not trying to be, you know, exactly right on the earnings per share in 18 months, but saying to ourselves, is it kind of a business in three years' time, if I come back, there's a strong likelihood, one, is still going to be there. Two, it's likely to be a somewhat bigger and more profitable business uh, than it is today. So you look at what are the characteristics of it. You want to own a business that, and I'm sure you know many of them, it's quite, there's no genius to knowing what represents a good business. You, you much prefer a business that sells 100 products in 150 countries around the world that uh, in, ideally it could be something that has a consumer attraction to it or if it's an industrial business, someone once described it, what you want to own is the, is the company that makes the valve that goes into the $100,000 pump which goes into the billion dollar refinery. Well, they're not going to scrimp on the valve. They want the very best valve they can get, get. and if you're the valve supplier, you've got a good business because they're just going, they're going to buy your product and you're actually going to be able to price your product aggressively because it's a very low cost component 
to the end product. And so there's, you look for these businesses. And as you look at it, um, and this gets to this whole question of, of risk, and there's an endless debate about risk. And most of the world today, I think, equates risk and volatility as one and the same. Risk is volatility. Um, we don't subscribe to that. Whether we're correct or incorrect, time will tell. But for us, I think if you want a, a, an analogy, risk is if you open up the newspaper one morning and you look at the FT and you find the creditor owns your business. Now, that's risk. If you're the equity guy and the creditor's got it, you have a problem. You've got nothing. And one of those things, you can, you can address that, I think, fairly simply by looking at capital structures. Um, you want to really make sure that it's not a business that's so leveraged that if you come into a difficult period of time, it's not going to come out the other side, or it has a very low probability of coming out the other side, or it's going to come out very handicapped. That's risk. The other side is if it's a, if it's a company with a single product, and it's a product that uh, you have some sense might just have in it the possibility of being leapfrogged. Someone's going to come up with the you know, cliche, the better mousetrap. That's risk. Your business dissolves pretty quickly. And I think those are things that you can develop a sense of comfort or discomfort about without too much effort. And it's always worth remembering. We often say, because we talk about these things several times a week, we get into a room. In our case, there's 75,000 securities out there we can look at. We only need about 30 of them. So if you're not sure, you can move on. And Munger had this great cliche he uses, I have two boxes on my desk. One is too hard, and I take all the annuals where it's too hard, and I put them in that box, and have the others which say, worth a look. And what you try and do is look at something and say, high probability, low probability. Let's not do it. Let's do it. Um, and then once you've got a sense of the your comfort with the business, that you think it's reasonably sustainable, it can, it can be a better business looking out over a number of years, you go and you look at, you look at, well, what have people paid for these businesses? And what you do, and what we do there is we look at sort of pre-tax earnings yield, because one of the mantras that people in this business have and we use in our office is you, you think like an owner when you buy a fractional interest in a business, you're an owner. If you own a business, if you own the business outright, what you put your hands on is the pre-tax income. And you can look at the pre-tax income relative to the valuation of the company in the market, and it's a fairly simple adjustment you make for the debt in the business um, and the cash. You, know, you, you have to look at debt, and the simple, the simple way of explaining that is if you have two houses on the corner down here, and they're, they're equally... Uh, if you will, they have the same things. They have four bedrooms, three baths, a family room, this, that, and the other thing, and they're both selling for $300,000, and you can buy them for $300,000, but you realize one of them has a $200,000 mortgage on it, and you have to assume it. Well, that purchase price is actually $500,000. So you adjust for debt when you look at it. And then you can look at what your yield is on these things. You want an analogy? We sometimes think of something as a growth bond. If we can buy something that's trading at seven or eight times pre-tax earnings, the reciprocal is about a 12.5% earnings yield. If you've got a business you think that over time could compound its, its uh, profitability at 4 or 5 or 6%, um, we don't like to get too aggressive, have big numbers on it to justify it. You start looking at something that... Uh, has sort of a growth yield on it, you get into the area of 15, 16, 17 percent. Those become very interesting numbers from a mathematical point of view. And then you can also go look at what people have paid for businesses. There's a long history of what people have paid. And you can look at the pricing and look at the multiples people have been willing to pay. And for certain kinds of businesses, obviously, much higher prices are paid for the some of the very same reasons I'm talking about here, the sustainability of it, the predictability of it, its position in a marketplace, whole series of factors. So then you get a, a range for what the business is worth. And the last step is, okay, so how's the market got it priced? If you think the thing is worth 
14 times or 12 times EBIT, and it's trading at 12 times EBIT, but it's a great business. You say, well, I don't need to own that here. And you go on to the next one. You keep it in mind. You have it over there in your scorecard. Um, and you wait for a spread because price does matter. And you wait for spread. If there's a spread, you make your investment in it, and you do it on a diversified basis. Um, we don't, some people concentrate, some people are very big concentrators, and I know that's a, a, a huge debate, and we, we concentrate probably way beyond what any mathematician would tell you is necessary to do, and I think it's probably just a, a function of our, maybe our insecurity, or, or I like to say our humility, I don't know whether it's that or not, but it is certainly insecurity, and, and an appreciation of just how damn competitive the world is. You can wake up and find yourself completely surprised. Um, we like to think of ourselves in the business of hitting singles and doubles and keep doing that. If you can keep your, your money compounding over time and you extend your time horizon, you should um, do very well. And, and the last thing I would say is when you do this, ask yourself, why are you investing? What are you investing for? And understand what it is you're trying to do. If you're trying to beat the stock market and you have a, a client who says everything hangs upon how you do relative to the index this year, or if you want to make a ton of money in any one year, I guess I'd say lots of luck. You can talk to people um, in this industry. I know some, some people at Dimensional Fund, and you'll talk to them about you mentioned our 20-year record, and, and I remember talking about it, and he looked at me and he says, it's not meaningful. It's not long enough. <laughs> so by, um, we happen to think by any stretch of the imagination, that's really long. But what you have to do is extend your time horizon if you're going to have any chance, again, of, of doing well. And then as you do that, of course, as I mentioned at the outset, the, competi the competition in the space really thins out. So you have an opportunity to arbitrage time over others. Um, and that, um, that concludes the, the remarks I have. I'd be happy to, and I hope you have some, some questions, because otherwise that would mean I've just bored you all to death. Um, but that is, that's very much the framework that we use. It's all about valuing a business. I don't talk about the commercial side. And lots of hand-holding, because a lot of clients just don't, they buy into it when you're doing well, but inevitably there's periods when you don't do well, and then they really, then it starts to eat them alive. Can I ask the first question? Yep. Um, I read uh, in the Wall Street Journal a few days ago an article about uh, the ABCs of investors' DNA. Yeah. And there's a quote here that says, a value investor who cannot withstand pain is not a value investor at all. Can you comment on that? Well, when stocks go down, it's always unpleasant. Um, will be points in time where you'll, you know, it's, what do they call it? I think the term is cognitive dissonance. Markets collapsing, stocks are going down. One guy runs down the hall and says, stocks are down. Chance to do something. Next guy walks down the hall and says, stocks are down. Um, look, the difficulty, there's always difficulty in it. Um, I don't know, perhaps we've, we've just been too marinated in this to, to reach a point where we say, gee, maybe the process doesn't work. I think what this has done, I come back to what I said before, one of its strengths is that it has enabled you to extend your time horizon, look at something and say, well, where are we likely to be in several years, um, owning this kind of business. It was very interesting when the market collapsed in 08 and 09, and everything went down. And obviously, it was a disaster. And we, subsequent to that, went back and looked at a lot of our businesses. Well, how did they do? Now, some businesses stood still. We happened to have owned, at that point in time, shares in Honda. Production at Honda really ground to a halt because people weren't buying automobiles, and they stopped filling up the lots for a period of time there. 
But the guys that made toothpaste and beer and cigarettes and underwear and all the rest of these things, they just kept turning that stuff out and people kept buying it. They, they, those things didn't go away. And what you did was you could look at, and what you do is you ask yourself, you go back to this, this um, concept of how is the business doing? If you forget to ask yourself how the business is doing, you're going to get stampeded out. And you're going to get stampeded out at the wrong time. Um, we see it in our business today. We've, we've essentially closed our business to, to new business. You've had about a what, four, four and a half year run in the market. And finally, all the people who sold out at the end are saying the market's come back. And they want to put their money back in the market. And we, like a lot of people, and sometimes you're only as good as the times you're in, have put together a string of pretty good years. Well, they think they're all, they're all still there to be had. And the truth of the matter is, it's not. And there's no point in taking on more money in a world with limited ideas. Um, I mean, it's no fun when it goes down, but, but you've got to remember what, again, come back to what are you investing for and what is it you own. And I think that just that keeps you in the game. Uh, you talked a little bit about, um, I think I'll just talk about, the, about this. Um, you talked about how you guys are, are much more concentrated. Uh, so I didn't know exactly what you, what you meant by that. So you, you talked about, you know, you guys need to, or you're more focused on hitting singles and, and doubles. But yeah. does, does concentrated mean sort of more than that? Or is it just sort of concentrated on sort of, you know, less risky businesses or concentrated? No, no. Concentrated means how much money you've got in a particular security when I talk about concentration. I think people who own 10 or fewer stocks are, tend to be called concentrators. Um, we... We as an organization, and I'll be honest, I don't have any empirical data to suggest that we've got the correct formula. We don't put more than approximately 4% of our money in a particular security. And if our, our, top, our top 20 holdings probably account for 65 to 70% of our, our portfolio, and then there's a, long, there's a longer list of, of other investments we have, some of which the, the price may not have been attractive enough, or also it may be of a capitalization size. We just can't own as much as we thought we might want to own. Um, Benjamin Graham used to say 3%. As best we can figure out, Graham got that number by doing this. That's where that diversification number came from. We, much of we've read about it, there's nothing which says why 3%. But um, by concentration, I mean owning fewer names, making bigger bets on a particular business. And we just, we don't, we don't do it that way. Okay. And kind of a follow-up to that, I was sort mm -hmm. of thinking, um, you know, if you are making only sort of putting 4% of capital towards sort of any one in investment, does that mean you're just focusing on, so like what size of business makes sense for you? And has that changed now that it's sort of an $18 billion fund as opposed to, you know, a couple billion dollars? There's no question there's been some change. Um, but... Um, it's partially also a function of markets. You know, small caps move up more, and, and it, it's interesting the definition of small caps shifts around. What's large cap, what's small cap? I think we probably, I think small caps now considered a, a billion dollars to three or four billion, and micros under a billion. Um, we probably have, I don't know, a third of our money in companies under, under five billion dollars, some under a billion, but, um, I mean, there's no way we can buy $100 million companies with $18 billion under management. And it's just not the case. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Hi there. Thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned a large series of biases that kind of separate the average investor from a value investor. What are the biases you see even at the value investor level, even in your firm, that kind of ever creep up every now and then? Because you said you can't really operate in this vacuum. So that, to me, seems that biases can still creep in even at the high informed level? Biases amongst the, the... Like among people who are, would consider themselves value investors. There's these biases they can get rid of to not be an average investor. And then even at the value investor, you might see biases creep in. Well, I don't know that there's any, any particular bias towards, um, towards one kind of business or another. Um, you know, people that in the history of, of 
people who have worked our organization, I don't think it's terribly different in most organizations. Um, one, you can't, you can't ever hire someone who's been doing it differently because it's impossible to sort of reprogram. Either, either something clicks about business valuation or it doesn't, and I'll get to your, hopefully get to an answer for you. Um, it clicks or it doesn't, and usually it'll be people who have a background one. It may have been a guy in investment banking who spends all his time evaluating businesses, so he's got that framework to think about it. Or you may just simply have been marinated in it over, over your lifetime because someone in your family did it forever, and it just kind of gets, if you will, almost bred into you. Um, and we had, um, we had one analyst who has subsequently retired and gone off to be a... Um, public advocate lawyer. You may have read about her. She was a woman who was involved with a uh, newspaper person up here in Canada for a number of years. She was referred to as a pit bull by him. She had been an investigative reporter for Forbes and the Wall Street Journal. And that's what drove her. So it was always this digging and digging and digging and digging and digging, trying to understand the, the nature of the business. Um, and I suppose the ugly side of it is that you have to have a bias, whether you like it or not. Um, in this business, you, it, you're in it because you want to make money, however, however that goes down with you. Um, if you don't have much interest in making money, it'd probably be a harder business to be happy in because uh, that's your job. And, and I think the moment you see your, your uh, money manager going out and trying to buy the Montreal Canadiens, something like that, you probably ought to find a new money manager. Because he's, his interests are changing. He's, he's not spending his time looking at, looking at that. So you ought to make sure his focus is there. But I can't think of any particular bias amongst our organization. Um, there's usually a, a um, allocation of labor. If someone spent 10 years looking at bottling businesses and the bottling business turns up and looks interesting, you'll let him do it and look at it, um, I think if there's, a, if there's a bias, if there's a um, tendency which, which you want to overcome, it's sometimes people don't want to part with the stock they own. And we always hammer that home. Um, we always say, you know, you're you going to make mistakes. This is a business that's full of mistakes. You want to you want to be right more than once in a row, and you want to be right more often than wrong. But there's always going to be mistakes, and you always evaluate everything. And sometimes it's when you talk to someone, it takes a little bit of time for, for them to come around and say, yeah, you know, I think maybe, yeah, all right, I made a mistake. We ought to get rid of it. So that could be a bias, a tendency to, to hang on when the ground has changed under you. And, and Maybe the best person to deal with that is someone who didn't didn't have all of the work invested in it himself that can keep raising the questions in a in a constructive way. Okay, thanks for joining us. Um, so uh, I was wondering, are, what are some of the challenges and opportunities you see for value investors in emerging and developing economies as they continue to grow and have a more important role in the global economy overall? I think one of the biggest problems you have is what do you do about currency? Um, currency can eat away your returns. How do you hedge out <clears throat> currency? I mean, as far as we can determine, there's no, we haven't yet seen a money manager that, who's a currency manager. We haven't seen an audited long-term record yet. Um, and you, know, you take the three largest currencies in the world, uh, and two of them, the dollar and the, and the euro, the euro swung between $1.50 and $0.82 cents, uh, over the past eight or nine years. I mean, that's, that's 10 years worth of returns right there on currency and this whole question of what do you do, what do, you do about currencies. We're, we're looking at a couple of securities in emerging markets now. Of course, no one wants to be in emerging markets today. And uh, it's very interesting. Two years ago, we were, I was talking to a group, and, and I was being um, you know, skewered because we, quote, had a lot of investments in Europe, although that's not accurate. We have a lot of investments in companies with headquarters in Europe that do business all over the world, and um, they didn't want to have anything to do with Europe, and they all wanted to be in the emerging markets, and today you've 
you've got the reverse of that. Everybody wants to get out of the emerging markets and be in Europe where they might just be able to patch and paste together a percent increase in GDP. I happen to think that the emerging markets, a number of them, um, are probably going to continue to be better places from an economic and an investment point of view over time for the simple reason they have growing populations, they have rapidly expanding middle classes, and you know the old expression is once they've seen Paris, you can't keep them on the farm, and the people that manage those countries and those economies are going to do everything they can to make sure that the aspirations of those people are met. And you know the businesses that are in the in the business, if you will, of providing the products to meet those aspirations are going to find a way to make money and prosper. So you've got these sort of larger factors which I think are going to continue to work to benefit you. In the meantime, you've got to figure out what you do with currency. You can hedge it, but hedging, depending upon the currency, can be very expensive. You can hedge in, 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 in Chile, and it'll cost you... 2% or 3%, and that's nothing. You hedge in Brazil, it's going to cost you 10. It eats away your margin at the rate of 10% a year. You always have to wrestle with that one, how you handle that. Thanks very much. And, ju and just to follow up, um, mm -hmm. have you found in the investments you've made in emerging markets in the past, as you mentioned, uh, has your search process or investment process had to be like, adapted at all to account for the, the different environment? Well, you have to understand what the rules and regulations are that drive businesses. They can be very. They can be different, and that's all just part of your due diligence. Um, you know, to what extent is the is the business regulated? What are the guidelines that the government sets up for a business? What are the what are the labor conditions? Um, can they can they make their business more efficient? Can they can they let people go if business is soft? You look at all of those things and try and sort them out. I don't think the accounting is is that that different. Uh, I think the most creative accounting in the world is in the United States. Um, and that's because I think in part the compensation in the United States is so, so keyed to stock price performance that you get an awful lot of um, accounting which enhances reported earnings. Um, years ago, when we first started investing outside the United States, that was always the question that came up. Oh, my God, what are you going to do about the accounting? And if you wanted sort of a broad brush picture of it all, um, our view was that accounting in Europe was a bit like a treasure hunt because one of the things that they had in many years, for instance, in Europe was that um, and businesses which had large family ownership components Europe has this, I don't know whether you have it in Canada, this wonderful tax convention called wealth tax. So if you own a big interest in a company and the price of the company's stock goes up, the government says, well, I want 2% of the appreciation whether you sold a share or not. That results in companies wanting to understate earnings. They don't want the stock to go up. Um, so I don't think the accounting is, is so much an issue as... as uh, um, you do worry whether they'll they'll make a, a big turn back to a period of very, very poor government. Um, there's always that question that you have to weigh. Uh, and that's that's essentially just a, trying to make an, an informed, I hate to use the word guess, but an informed guess that they'll, they'll figure it out. Now, you can go through the back door, which we do in a, in a very substantial way. Um, we have a lot of exposure to those markets, largely through many of the businesses we own. Um, if you look at just some of the biggest household names in the world, and you look at Unilever, not that we own it or don't own it, they do half of their business in that part of the world. And this is an $80 billion business or something of that order. Nestle's the same way. Diageo. Philip Morris is all international. They don't do anything in the United States. Um, and they're dealing with that all across the world. They're sort of doing that work for you and sorting it out. Um. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, are there some sectors or some industries that you tend to avoid in general? And uh, if yes, for what reasons? Yeah, I, I mean, it probably comes as no surprise. It's always been said that the the, the value guys don't buy <coughs> don't buy tech um, because it's a little it's a little harder to understand the dynamic, and you do have this question of of obsolescence and when and how quickly it can occur. Um, a nice consumer products company, you don't have the, you don't have the issue of obsolescence. Um, we, we, don't, we don't buy new issues. We don't, if you can't pencil something out that begins to make sense, we can't do it. If we've got to have an exponential growth rate and a 10-year horizon to get to a number where some candy store arithmetic starts to make sense, we don't bother. We'll just, we go on to the next one. Something else will make sense. Um, and it's just this whole fat tail question, which is so hard to get your arms around. I mean, one of the big debates in, um, is, you know, is Cisco, if you just bought Cisco on the numbers, you got $9 a share in cash, stock's 22, 60% return on capital, 75% market shares, entrenched. You talk to people, it's very hard to get rid of the Cisco equipment because they get rid of part of it, and they bring in another piece from someone else. The guy that comes in from Cisco says, it's not my job. It's his problem. And so all these things which, which suggest it's entrenched, but lo and behold, there are other things. You know, you see this, quote, cloud, which I must confess to you is still a bit of a cloud to me. Um, but they're suggesting that um, they don't really need the, the more expensive Cisco servers. They get these, the phrase is always used, is white box. AT&T just announced they're going to white boxes. They're going to completely reconfigure their whole IT system. Um, those are tough things to, to, to get a handle on. So, but, so technology always presents an issue because of the nature of it. It's a, in many cases, a single product, uh, highly competitive, where a technological edge will make a huge difference and can have a dramatic impact on the business. Thank you. And uh, just as a follow-up question, uh, what do you do when you don't find any investment opportunities out there in the market? Do you keep everything in cash? Or? You just sit around. Yeah. Um, you just you keep looking because things can turn up. But as I said before, you know who's it? The French philosopher Pascal once said that most of man's misery comes from his inability to sit still. <laughs> and uh, it's very important to sit still at certain points of time. You don't have to do anything. You can let the stock do the work. We'll let cash build up. Yes. Now, now we have some clients that you know, we if you run a business, got a commercial interest in the business, who, who they've given us an asset allocation. They say, you've got to be 95% in all the time, and we'll just go down the list for any big cap stock and throw it in if we don't put it in. I, it, interesting. We had one extreme example. A while ago, we had this um, pension fund. probably find this amusing. Um, as soon as we had 5% cash, he took it and put it in S&P futures and monetized it. He took it away from us. <laughs> that was his approach. It's not our approach. Our money, and we like to think of our clients' money as our money. Um, you know, we have some cash, but one way to think about cash, I guess we have 15 16% cash. That's four or five good stocks away from being fully invested. History of markets has been that we'll probably find four or five stocks at some point in time here if we just sit tight. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks for coming. So you mentioned before that you're looking for a business that's sustainable in the long run, but that also that you'll look at potentially uh, compounding of earnings growth. I think the number was something like 4 to 6%. And we, when we've talked in class, a lot of it has been kind of not placing a lot of value on growth unless it's a very special circumstance. So how do you value growth? Is that something that you do very numerically, or is it more high level and saying, you know, I see this business compounding, but we don't necessarily put a number on it? It's, it's, it's that, the latter. This is business that's likely to compound. Um, 
if you take a business that's selling products to the to the consumer and they're starting to sell it in more and more countries and they're selling multiple products and you think about profitability, well, if they've got 100 products in 150 countries, that's, I don't know, how many different, if you will, points in the price line where someone may try and raise the price a little bit and that's what they're doing every day because people in those businesses are paid for the profitability they generate and you get a little bit of volume increase, you get a little bit of efficiency, you get a little bit of inflation and you can patch and paste together in some cases a reasonable expectation for growth over time, not every quarter. It's not a passbook savings account. But again, I go back to if you, if you found a business where you bought in and your yield, your current yield, if we all owned it, we're all brothers and sisters, enormous family, and we owned some company. And we're currently, it's paying us 12.5%. Well, that's not bad as a starter to think about. And if we think it can be do three or four or five, uh, then we're going up to 17 or 18 percent. So if someone came along and said, I'll sell it to you at a, at a 10 percent yield, we'd buy it. And if someone said, I'll buy it from you at a 6 percent yield, we'd say, here, you can have some. It's just arithmetic. And it's reasonable arithmetic. You'd, we don't want to be in the business of having to have an aggressive assumption for, for the expansion of a business to justify a price being paid. I just had a quick question on uh, when you're doing a net asset valuation, what's the best way to like, look at valuing goodwill? I think that's a very tricky area, area since it, and goodwill is like an accumulation of a bunch of acquisitions of a business. So how would you, do you have any method or methodology used to kind of value goodwill? <clears throat> yeah, that's that's... You know, Buffett, I guess, talks about that in his annuals all the time, doesn't he? There's, there's, there's Goodwill, which is the brand for Coca-Cola, and Marlboro, which is probably really worth something. Although, you're probably going to be able to look at an earnings yield on something like that to begin with. And then if it's a, it's common sense, if it's a premium paid for what you think is a junky business and they're amortizing it, you probably say it's really not worth much. You did, what's the nature of the thing they bought? It, does it have some justifiable value? Um, and then you can plug it or not plug it. But it's, you know, it, it's, it's to a great extent, just it's common. You, you try and just be sensible about it. Uh, is it a brand that's not destroyed very easily uh, and they paid a bit of a premium for it? Yeah, that the arithmetic still makes some sense to you? That's, someone will pay you for that. You sort of ask yourself, would someone pay me for that? Um, but if you bought a big, you know, a big box store outside of Dayton uh, for a big premium, a lot of goodwill on it, you know, you might be stuck. I wouldn't necessarily put that into my calculation. Ask yourself what it is. It's not, it's not formulaic. Thank you, Mr. Brown. You mentioned in your talk, you mentioned the word bias a couple of times uh, in terms of individual investors and also in institutions. So my question is about institutions and a bias for uh, returns quickly, quarter over quarter, and what would it take uh, to change the incentives to have more of a long-term view um, in class, in our value investing class, we talked about a hypothetical uh, portfolio manager of a mutual fund making a certain return that was expected and not feeling the need to uh, then, then selling and going to other stocks rather than holding on for the long term uh, with the value investing approach. Uh, so could you speak to that, that uh, what would it take to change the incentives and the likelihood that something like that would come to pass? I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I get it. You're talking about the one, the, the institutional? Yeah, the institutional investors, um, I guess the employees of they the They have companies. no conviction. Largely the pension fund is, is, most of them are convictionless, if that's a word. And it's usually run by a person who, this is a stepping stone position, and he can really be an agent of change. <laughs> That's the reality with these guys. Um, 
you can have you can have very good ran runs and then they bring in a consultant and they change the idea we, we've been fortunate we've had a couple we've had for a long time um, we try and 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 ballyhoo it we've had one account FMC corporation since the 1980s and they've had an extraordinary record and they stay with us the whole time we talk about it but we have a lot of we, we have a Canadian uh, a big Canadian pension plan here um, recently decided to cut us way back and we had beat their benchmark by 600 basis points and we thought we were in good shape decided they're going to go to um, market independent Inve uh, investment firms, whatever that means. Um, I guess the trick is if you're in the business, you've got to have a lot of customers. Us, we do it the same way. We, we, we're trying to be as sensible as we can about returns, and it all comes back to what is it we own and how is it valued. And we have no idea when or how the returns are going to be earned, but we know on average over time the returns have been pretty good. And you just got to try and communicate that, and hopefully you're successful con communicating it to people, and they stick with you. Um, you'll always find some, uh, you'll always find some, some value junkies who will be with you for a long time because they, they it clicks and it makes sense, and, and frankly, it's served them pretty well. Hi, my question is: uh, as a classic value investor, I'm wondering how you feel about activist investing. I know that uh, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of headlines with uh, yeah. Carl Icahn and Bill Ackman, guys who kind of consider themselves at, you know, uh, at, at its core. They consider themselves sometimes to be value investors, but they take a very different approach than someone like yourself. Yeah, they do take a, a, a different approach. Some of them, and, and within that group, they're very different approaches. I happen to think I don't know the man very well, and, and he's, he may uh, – he may have met his Waterloo on this Herbalife. I don't know. Uh, and he's, he's dug himself in. And I just don't think you should ever dig yourself in too hard in any particular security, although if you're a concentrator, you have that problem. Um, but he's, he's had a pretty good nose for buying things that, that have some um, substantial value that can be unearthed if, if you can get the managements to do it. Uh, I don't want to be quoted on ICON. Um, but uh, I think a lot of what ICON does is, and we have a lot of it in the United States, I call it hit-and-run capitalism. Go in there, shake them up, lever them up, buy a lot of stock, get a payout, and move on. And I'm not sure that that's the best thing for if you step back from the statement I made before you're in the business of making money. I'm not sure that's uh, one. I don't think it's the best way to make money, and I'm not sure it's the best thing that, that uh, can happen to a business. So as a follow-up question, would you agree that uh, many activist investors are in it for the short, the short term? Because I know that uh, Pershing Square and Bill Ackman, he often likes to suggest that you know, they're, they're agents of change with a long Yeah, they're not builders. I don't think they're in, in, in for, a, for a business. They're not buying into the business because they think they can sit with it for at least the evidence would suggest they're not doing it because they think they can sit with it for four or five years, and make a lot of money. They, <clears throat> I think they, perhaps more than us, um, really have to generate returns. The people that are, a lot of the people that are investing with them are looking for, you know, big, outsized, pretty predictable returns, and uh, and they got to generate that. Is the business? I think the business that they have is is less sticky. Not to say that ours is glued down. Hi. Um, given that value investors typically uh, favor the the bear markets, how do you outperform the benchmark when it's doing really well? For example, yes, yesterday the S and P just hit its all time high. So will this be a time where you look for some stocks that do really well in a bull market, or would you just um, have a bit more cash on hand? Just wait. For no, we'll just have more cash. Um, we we always try and make a point. We tell people that there, you know, the one thing you'd love to do is beat the market every year, year in, year out, quarter in, quarter out, and it just isn't going to happen. And um, at this point in time, as we said to people, so we have 15, 16, 17 percent cash, whatever it is. If our stocks do as well as the market. Um, on average, they've done as well, a little bit better than the market. Then we're going to underperform the market by 17 or 18 percent. 
And that's just real simple arithmetic. But uh, that's, that's the way we, we're going to do it. And if you tell people ahead of time, uh, that's what you're doing. There are some who understand it. You know, there's this, we often ask the, the question of people when they come in to, um, and ask them, and you've probably heard it said, you ask them, okay, we're going to manage your money. Let me ask you a question. What would you do differently if we doubled your money? You say, mm, not that much, probably. You say, what would you do if we lost half your money? You say, oh, Christ, that would be a disaster. That's probably the kind of person you want as a, as a, as a client, um, particularly with individuals. Um, they're, you know, they're wealthy and they want to stay wealthy, and um, they may be less benchmark oriented. But we, we don't we don't start to look for stocks which we think are going to uh, outperform the market because it's a bull market. Then you're playing the other guy's game. That's a fool's game for us. We just not going to bother. Uh, I don't have a formula that. If I did it once and I got it right, that would just be dumb, really dumb luck. Um, and to some extent, which, what happens to you in life is, is a function of when you were born, where you were born, and some good fortune, and also maybe some, some good work. But as we were saying at the outset, you know, when I came in, when I was in this business, um, it was a long time ago. It doesn't seem that long ago, but uh, we were looking at a 22% prime rate and went from 22 to what two that's a hell of a tailwind it's always good to keep that in mind it's not just it's not just genius but again something that can keep you tethered to the some logic is helpful uh, you have talked a lot about uh, talk a lot about the criteria of uh, selecting the stock or buying stock I want to hear more about your criteria regarding selling a stock this may happen that two conditions, uh, two kind of situations. First one is that uh, uh, the stock price just go up, and what's your criteria? Well, how, how do you make decisions? What's the time, right time to sell it? The second criteria, of course, <coughs> that uh, when the stock price going down and down, and uh, how do you decide it? Okay, probably we select the wrong stock, and it's time to just sell it. Yep. Um, I mean, the simple answer to how you sell, of course, is just the other side of how you bought. Is it, is it fully valued? And to be honest, there are some securities you keep because they're good businesses and they're compounding, and you think that it, it will continue compounding. So you, you tend to hang on to some of it. You will feed some out into the marketplace. Um, and it's not kind of a, oh, bang, there it is, there it goes. Um, one of the things that at least I've observed, and I think there's some actually uh, some, some data on this that suggests that, you know, this momentum in securities tends to continue for some period of time. Usually when you're, when security's gone up and it's fully priced and it's acting very well and continuing to do well, you can probably take your time feeding that back into the market because if you spent 10 minutes just asking around, you'll find out that there's people who are recommending it, there's something going on inside the business that everyone's getting excited about. Um, all of this good news which is filling the space around the company, so there's no rush really to dump the thing and get out of it. You can, you can work your way out of the security. If it doesn't get too far out of line, um, you can stay with part of it because it will be a compounder. And this is always this question if you're a taxpayer. You, know, you have this silent partner and you have this makeup arithmetic. If you sell a security, um, I don't know what the capital gains is up here, but uh, you know, if you're a resident of New York State, then then your capital gains tax, you're giving 35% of your gain to the government. You've got to ask yourself, can I make that up plus my appreciation <laughs> on the new idea? And you kind of, you kind of weigh that. But if it, if it gets way out of line, you just you go. And that's, that's for what you think is a pretty good sustainable business. If it's a, if it's a paper company and just a cyclical business, you, you, you do. You just get out of it because it, it doesn't have the likelihood that it can sustainably expand its business over time. It tends to be a feast and famine up and down, high fixed cost. You know, someone once explained it to me. I went, when I first started as an analyst, I went to a paper mill and looked at a paper machine. I don't know whether you've ever seen a paper machine. They're about a, they're about a hundred meters long and 
four stories high and 20 meters wide, and it goes 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And along about day 322, it breaks into the black. <laughs> that's, kind of, that's a rotten business. That's just a rotten business. Um, because if it softens and they can't keep putting it out, then it all of a sudden it just it bleeds. Huge high fixed cost businesses, terrible businesses to be in. Those you get out of. Um, if there's a little bit less beer being sold because it was a cold winter in Europe, well, chances are it'll warm up next summer. You can look at that and say, well, I'll, I'll stick around. There's no reason to dump this whole bloody thing and hope for the hot weather. The hot weather will come, and I'm not going to pay the tax man his, his tithe on it. Um, so. Okay, uh, my second question is that, um, as I understand, you have night. Nineteen billion uh, dollars, and invest to a uh, small, a uh, limited number of companies, and uh, probably you will ha have a substantial part of the share. So, I, my question is, uh, what kind of uh, involvement do you have to this <coughs> company's board? Is there any special or different thing that you are from different from other kind of investors? Well, I think obviously, if you own a lot of, if you own a substantial amount of stock in something, they tend to find their way to your office to talk with you about their business and what's going on. And you can, you can opine with them about what you think would make sense. And some people you can end up with a pretty good, pretty good dialogue on uh, about whether you, you, know, you have a, a view on something which you think might make sense to them. But largely, we, we're not we're not confrontational. We go into business because we like the dynamic that's going on. Um, we don't go in with the idea of we want to upset the apple cart. That's an enormously time-consuming process. We'd rather not be in a business where the success of the investment is going to require a lot of agitation on our part. We just did. I just not that we're lazy. I just think there's easier ways for us to make a living and earn a return. Um, we, will, we will get involved if we think they're doing something which is just, just not right, just really, if you will, diluting our value in the business. We'll, we'll speak up if we see something going on and say things. Um, and that, at times, can, be, can have some impact particularly if you get on the telephone and call a couple other guys. Then you've got you know, 15, 20% of the stock calling them up. Um, but that's the exception as opposed to the rule. Yeah. I think most people in their businesses are trying to do a legitimate job. It's been our experience. You can look at the record. That's really the only thing you can, you can go on. I know a lot of people talk about it. They say, I, I never invest in, the, in a business until, until I go and I see the management and I look them in the eye. Well, all you guys are looking at me in the eye. You don't know whether I'm a damn liar or not. That's, that's the simple truth. <laughs> the only thing you can go on is what you've done um, and whether what they seem to be saying makes sense and whether the business makes sense. Um, and they all will tell you, they will all tell you um, that their stock is cheap. Been at this 40 years. I've never had a guy come in and say, don't buy the stock. It's fully priced. <laughs> they don't do it. But that's natural. Um, thank you, Mr. Brown, for the presentation. I um, just would like to get a sense of your style when um, you explore new ideas. So um, when you see a potential stock idea, do you look at the sell side research report or do you start from scratch? when you dig out the information. Because when you look at the sales side report, it is faster, but it forms an impression on you because they are so bullish about the company, and that might hinder your um, perception of the company. But when you start from scratch, you take up a lot of time, and then you have to decide whether um, I should <coughs> spend the next few months or so, or next few weeks or so, to uh, spend my time looking at this company. Yeah. So yeah, yep. I'd like to get a view on it. Well, we don't, use, we don't use the sell side for the decision to buy or sell. But if you're, if you're looking at, and you haven't looked at, for instance, we made an investment about 15 months ago in a jet engine business. 
And there's, there's in a very general way, the, the jet engine business is like the razor blade business. They give the engine away because all the money's in the parts. And you know if the engine has been designated to go on a certain airplane and they're going to produce X number of airplanes, that after so many hours of flight, that goes in to the shop and that goes in for parts. And the margin on the parts is 60 or 70 percent. They make it all on the parts. And the fact of the matter is, they buy the parts from the original manufacturer. They don't go to Joe's jet engine blade shop and put those on their engines. So you can see the business with lags. Well, you can talk to people about, uh, um, so what's, what's Boeing's prediction for 737 NEO production? And what does the order book look like? Who's ordering the airplanes? How many are being considered? Because you know that the, the, the CF-56 has been designated as the engine that goes on that airplane. They've made the wing to hang that airplane on. And you go and talk to someone about that. You don't need to spend forever trying to find that piece of data. There's a guy who spends his whole life, that's all he does, how he earns his living. He'll give that to you. You can, you can give him an order to pay him. So you use them for a lot of background to come up to speed uh, if you think the business is attractive, something you want to be in. Um, and they're, they're very good at that. But again, as I said, they're, they're a view on whether you want to buy it or not buy it. Um, this happened to be an interesting business, and you can see the cycle. The engines are put on the airplanes, and it's usually five to six years before the engines come in. And in this case, there were 1,500 engines that were somehow or another going to come in for work over the next nine to 18 months. And then there was softness in air travel. Well, they want to touch the damn thing up. They want to do. They just cycle slow down. They're not coming in yet, and so he he won't recommend the security. Now that's where we we look at it and say, I got a different view because I had a different time horizon. I can I can see the business unfolding very happily here in in six to twelve months. But you do use them for background. You know? right. I've been, one example is to give you an example, and and we hadn't gone and done the work, but um, we had made a some investments, very successful ones, in Coca-Cola bottlers in Mexico and Central America. And um, they looked like they had been good businesses. They'd done very well. And you knew that Coke from time to time bought these back. And, and some of the very big bottlers were consolidating them. And you, you know that there were a lot of people in Mexico. And you know it's hot. And, and you know the water's not so good, so there is a lot of soda that's being you know, consumed. But the interesting thing about it, and this is where it was helpful talking to someone, an analyst in Mexico. He said, well, you, you know how they sell this? I said, no. He said, well, you ought to come down here, and, and we'll, we'll go out into the countryside, and we'll go to some little pueblos, towns, and the local tienda sells, you go into it, it's a shop that's probably, you know, goes from here over to there, and it's that deep. And they got a cooler in there. And on the cooler it says Coca-Cola. And there's only Coca-Cola in the cooler. And what Coca-Cola has done is gone all around Mexico and said to the shopkeeper, I'm going to give you a cooler, I'm going to keep your cooler up, I'm going to take care of it, and I'm going to pay you something for the cooler, and there's only one stipulation, only Coca-Cola. There's distribution. They can't buy Pepsi-Cola because <laughs> it's only Coca-Cola, and they lock up their markets that way. Those are the sort of things that you try and you try and develop an understanding of and a sense of when you when you when you look at these things. You say, well, that that feels more like a lock here, uh, and that we. We got by spending a lot of time talking to a, a fellow in, in, in Mexico City. You wouldn't figure that out riding around London, Ontario, or, you know, Fort Lee, New Jersey. So you, you keep trying to paste and patch the picture together as best you can. Warren Buffett has 
has often said that the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping from old ones, which, by the way, is a great quote by Keynes. And in value investing, we've seen that uh, the concepts have evolved from net nets to franchisee value. So my <coughs> question to you is, how has your investing style transitioned over a period of time? And can you talk about one of the most difficult times when, when you were trying to value a company and the styling required the more present method and, and you were reflecting back to the old investing style? Well, I think that, you know, I, interesting, I don't know whether I have a correct answer for you. I mean, the, the old investing style was the statistical, the book value and the rest of it, and that doesn't lend itself to to trying to figure out a, a, a business value that's an operating entity, a completely different exercise. And I'm not sure that there are that many ways you can go at trying to figure out a business, an operating value of a business which is premised on an income stream other than to look at that income stream and go back to is it is it going to continue and what's a reasonable multiple to pay for that adjusted for for the price um, so I don't know that there's been a question where we, we should have flipped back to another if I'm answering your question correctly another approach to looking at it it's usually some dimension to the business that you didn't understand that trips you up um, that gets hidden in it we, we invested a number of years ago in what we thought was a a great business is one of these um, laboratory business. I'm sure you have the same thing here. You go to the doctor's office and the doctor, um, you go in and the doctor you know, takes some blood and this and that and the other thing and it's all out front in what we call a milk box outside the doctor's office. And the lab guy comes by and he picks it all up. He takes it to the lab and he throws it in a centrifuge and does the data. The doctor gets his information back and it seemed like a pretty good business. These guys had all the distribution where they were and the government... Uh, um, did some um, payment of that for the tests being done, and the, the individual picked it up. Our health care is very different than yours, as you probably hear about. Um, and um, so they're making a lot of money at it. It was a good business and just kept growing and growing and growing. And one day we woke up, and you read the newspaper, and uh, you found out that the, the government wasn't going to reimburse for a certain blood test that was batched as they put it into the centrifuge. And when it went to the centrifuge, it was like cable TV pricing. Well, you want, you want the golf channel, you're going to get the Haitian music channel, and you're going to get this channel and that channel and the other channel for all of them. The government said, no, no, no more. You can't do that. And all of a sudden, they cut, they cut $8 out of every run through the centrifuge. There's no way you could have figured that one out. There's no way. I mean, as much as you figured, tried to sort that one out. So you get, I mean, you get surprised. Uh, one is about value traps. You Why? Have value traps. Value traps. You have a way of identifying value traps. Have you ever invested in a value trap? What do you do? Yeah, now, I'm not trying to be, and I'm not trying to be, be rude. I sometimes, I, people always ask us, so how do you avoid <clears throat> value traps? Said, I don't know. It's it's you know you make mistakes and and the business doesn't turn itself around. But then I I look at them and say, well, you always ask about the value trap, and to me a value trap means, or about a, on a worst case basis, dead money. Well, dead money, not the end of the world. And I say, let's talk about a growth trap instead. Growth trap is you're in the stock because it's premised on 15% growth and it comes in at 12 and whoosh, stock goes right down the elevator. Um, there's no way that you're, you're, you're ever ultimately going to say, I've got a formula which enables me to avoid a value trap. It's just one more dimension to trying to figure out what a business is worth. Um, and you can sometimes, and I think this is one of the benefits of, of being diversified. You know, some people, I see it, I have one, my poor brother who's just a, I mean, he's a disaster so far as investing goes. He's not in the investment business and the, the mistakes he makes all the time. And, and he always, he'll own a stock and he'll come back and say, I'm so sick of this goddamn stock, I'm getting rid of it. And I say, why are you doing that? He said, I haven't done anything. His problem is that he owned three stocks. He only looks at those three stocks, and that one's driving him nuts. And he's over-focused on it. So he gets rid of it. 
He's made an emotional decision. And later it either works out or doesn't work out, but he's sort of thrown in the towel because nothing's happened and there's no way to time when things are going to happen. But again, uh, I'm dodging your question. There is no way to um, ultimately say we're never going to have a value trap because, I mean, things can change. It's a competitive world, and if things change, you can either either you've made a mistake in your analysis based upon the the facts, and nothing's changed, or else the, there's been a change in the in the environment that's that's made it different. And you, you'll look at that, and then you'll say, "Well, okay, it's we." There's no spread. Let's get out. Take your take your lumps, and you have your mistake. And uh, again, keep trying to f be right more often than wrong. What is the most important thing in life and investing that you learned over the last thirty years? Um, well, I have a little philosophy of life, and. Uh, Rule number one is live below your means because then no one's ever going to be able to come after you. Um, two, always tell the truth because then you're never going to have to remember what you said. It's all just going to come out. And if you're in business, I think it's fair to say that your clients will always forgive you for a dumb mistake but they'll never forgive you for a dishonest one. So, and it can take decades to build a reputation and minutes to destroy it. And then the other one, which is less related to, to business, is um, always count to 10 before you open your mouth because you can't take back what you've said and, uh, and be flexible. That's my... At least what I try to do. <laughs> well, thank you.